before we start, I can't remember exactly when Rui called me, but I think I was traveling somewhere, and he called me, and he said, I've got this crazy idea. And I was like, do, do it. And a little bit of me thought, will Rui ever do it, right? But I never said that, but he's, and he's done it. So I say we should give Rui a round of applause, right, for, for living our dreams, right? Okay. So I'm going to talk to you today. We're going to kick things off with this talk, The Power of Brand Archetypes. As Rui says, I've used archetypes for a number of years. I'll explain what they are in a minute. But really what I'd like to do is just start off with, what are you going to get out of this first session? Well, two key things. I really want to, if you've never heard of archetypes before, you're thinking, what the heck is that? Don't worry, I'll explain it. And I want you to go away with at least an understanding of what they are and why anybody involved in building brands or creating assets for brands should be, at least be aware of them, right? So that's the first one. And the other thing is, is not hopefully just be aware of it, I'm gonna try my absolute best to show you how you can use this idea to actually bring it into your companies, into your work, so that you can kind of really kind of amplify and be better at what you do. We're gonna do three key things. There's three, there are three stages to my talk today. First of all, I'm not gonna to spend too much of time on this, but I'm kind of like a brand strategy kind of guy. So I'm, I, I sort of sit up the top, sort of in the sort of the clouds, imagining the future with, with leadership teams. And I'm gonna to explain to you my four big brand questions. It's a simple framework I use, because then you'll see where this fits into that framework. Second thing is we're gonna dive into a bit of story theory uh, and show you how archetypes sit in with that. And finally, as I've said, we wanna make this practical. So I wanna try and show you how you can use it in your work. And then if we get time, Rui's nervous I'm gonna go over time, but I'm not, I'm gonna, and we're gonna have time for Q&A. So if you've got any questions, I would just ask, jot them down, and then um, I'll come to you at the end. So that'll be, that'll be great. Okay, first up, bit of theory about what I do. So first of all, a lot of people, when you say brand, they think a logo and some fonts, like Rui's been showing us. And of course, logo and fonts are important to all the creative graphic designers out there, and I used to be one of you, so yay for the creatives. But let's be honest, the world's greatest logo doesn't equal the world's greatest brand. So what is a brand then? So this is my definition of brand. It's actually the meaning people attach to you and your offer. It's what they feel in their hearts and their minds. It's a scary definition, that, right? Because actually what it says, when I talk to business leaders, it kind of scares them because it's like, hang on, wait, don't we control that? No, we control the signals we ping out, but ultimately the brand exists in the hearts and the minds of our users, of our customers, of the people that, that come across us. So what, what the game I'm in is the game of branding, and I think everybody here in some small capacity right up to a big capacity will be in this game too, which is the attempt, the audacious attempt to manage that meaning, to hopefully influence people in the right way, so ultimately they buy from us. And so what I'm often involved in is this little thing called brand strategy, which is basically looking at how do we manage that meaning? How can we pull a plan together so that actually all of our teams from the bottom of the organization right to the top can all be pointing in the same direction and understanding the meaning that we want people to attach. Now the first stage of any sort of strategic intent is that we have to define where we are now and where we want to go. And so this tool I'm going to share with you, this theory around archetypes, sits very much at that sort of strategic level. And I'm hoping this warm-up act will lead into some of the great speakers that we've got later and that it will all dove to get, tail, tail together well. If there's one thing that I want you to take away with why you should use archetypes, it's this, alignment. I don't know about you, but I find that this is the hardest thing to achieve when you've got people together. Because everybody kind of has a view, has an opinion, egos get involved, then, you know, things start to break apart a little bit, and then there's politics, and it's a nightmare. So what I like to do is come with a tool like this, which is kind of um, not exactly, uh, uh, I don't know, directly related often to a business. It's kind of more conceptual, and it helps build the, the basic building blocks of what might come later, both from a business and a commercial perspective, but I know we've got a lot of designers in the room. In fact, let's do this. Hands up if you would consider yourself a designer in the room. So, all of you designers know exactly what I'm talking about when you need this alignment, right? You do some work and you're like, hey, I fulfilled the brief, and then someone in the business says, 
uh, I don't understand how this connects, and then it all gets a bit murky. So strategic tools help bring an alignment, and archetypes for me have been one of the most powerful ways of, of doing that. So I promised, I promised we'd go through three sections. So a nice big number one, so we know which section we're in. Number one, big brand question. So this is very sort of quick um, overview. I often think, if we were saying, okay, we need to manage some meaning, I like to ask this of leadership teams. And I think these are questions that you could begin to ask even if you know, you're a product designer or if you're a creative designer, four big questions. So these are outside of the brief normally that you've got in front of you, your, t your tactical brief. These are the strategic questions. So why do we exist beyond making money? It's a huge question. Because if we don't know the answer to that, then basically our focus might be in the wrong place. Our focus will be in generating income, which is great for you, it's great for the business, it's great for the C-suite, it's great for the board, but frankly, you're not gonna generate any money unless you're relevant to a customer, because the customer's not gonna pay anything. So we've gotta figure that out in a big way. What's our value proposition? What is it that's gonna make someone put their hand in their pocket and pay, um, pay for our service or our product? And why should we do that? Um, and the second question, who do we exist to serve? That kind of follows on because we need to really understand the user, the customer, what they want, what they're trying to become, what they're trying to achieve so that we can continue to add value. What is their problem? What keeps them up at night? So it's a big question. Then what are we going to offer them to help them overcome that challenge and problem? And I know we've got a lot of product designers in the room, so you, know, you continually iterate, don't you, on that question to make it better and better and better to create more and more value. And then finally... Well, how are we going to show up for these people? Now, for all the creative people, um, creative designers in the room, this is the big question, but you can't answer this question properly. You can't really do your job unless you seriously know and have alignment around the other three questions. In other words, how are we going to show up? What is the logo and the fonts going to look like? But more than that, how are we going to speak? How are we going to sound? What are the experiences that we're going to create for people? And how will we know whether they're on, on brand or not, that they're going to create the right meaning or not? So these are the big, for me, the big brand questions. And in that how as well, you need to figure out how you're gonna be different from your competition and how that's gonna make an impact. Now, archetypes, let's get back to that. You're like, Matt, get back to archetypes. Okay, I'm getting back. Archetypes sit here in the how. And by the way, massive credit to Simon Sinek, if anyone's watched Simon Sinek's talks, on the, on the, uh, on the you know, the, uh, the golden circle, um, credit where it's due. But I think Simon, bless him, I've never met him, but. I'm sure he's awesome. I think he missed out this one, which is the who, right? That's really important. Who do we do it for? But in regards to this, anyway, the how. How do we show up is where archetypes come in. So let's get on to what on earth archetypes are and why they're useful and, you know, what we should do with them. Quick walk across stage. So here's a big question. As human beings sat here in this room, how do each and every one of us create meaning in our minds? Is it, for example, through Excel spreadsheets and data? I'm not so sure it is. The answer the psychologists tell us, and I'll put a bit of, I'm not a psychologist, but there'll be some psychology in here, so bear with me, this is a layman's psychology um, course. The answer is stories, narrative. So what the psychologists actually tell us is as we're growing up, we actually create our own story of ourselves in our minds, through our adolescence. And then in life, as we're living our lives, if things marry to that storyline that we've created for ourselves, if they, they align to that, we feel happy, we feel contentment, life is good. But if an area in our life doesn't quite fit with the story that we've written in our own minds, it might be in an area of our life like relationships or you know, material wealth or whatever it might be, we feel dissatisfied, we feel upset. And so we look around to bring things back on track. We look to other people, we look to uh, systems and processes, we look to brands who will help us become what we want to become. So this is kind of how it works. This is, uh, it's kind of a backwards and up and down kind of thing. So stories create meaning in our minds, and the meaning that we, we have actually creates brands, because if we, can, if we can leverage that meaning and create brands from it, then our audiences are gonna be attached to it. But you see, therefore, brands create meaning which creates stories for customers. So it's kind of like an up-down model that we need to understand. Meaning is the glue that actually builds brands and products and services and companies and wealth. 
if we can create that meaning effectively and it's valuable for society. So, told you, I told you there'll be some psychology. So, I'm not a psychologist, so I'll just read a couple of cool stuff that psychologists have said. So, this is a really interesting uh, report from Psychology Today uh, by Peter Noel Murray. He said this, when evaluating brands, functional MRI neuroimagery shows that consumers primarily use emotions rather than information to make decisions. Advertising research has shown that consumers are more likely to buy a product because of the emotional response they feel to an advert, as opposed to the information and content of the advert's offer. I'm sure we all know this, right? We often say, like, you buy with your heart and then you justify it with your brain, right? My wife's here, I'm always trying to justify things with my brain, and it never often works. I'm just, well, I kind of just like it. Um, he goes on to say, the emotions that a brand evokes can be found in its narrative. This is important. We're going to come back to this in a second. The story that communicates who it is, what it means to the consumer, and why the consumer should care. This narrative is the basis for brand advertising and promotion. When everything is stripped back, a brand, like a person, is simply a story. We're defined by the stories we tell and that are told about us, and brands are part of that story. So if you think about it, that's quite a profound statement, right? People are out there buying brands, buying your products, buying your services, and doing so actually says something about them, says something about the challenges they have, what they're trying to achieve, the narrative they have of themselves in their mind, and, and the collective narrative they have as a company. And so we need to really think about this. What is the story that our consumers are living, our customers are living, and how do we show up in that story for them? to help them through so that the narrative fits and, and helps them to get where they need to go. One more, I think there's just, oh, there's a couple bits more theory, but bear with me. Is this okay? It's not too heavy, right? This is all right. Yeah, nah, this is easy for intelligent people like you. Right, here's another one. Here's Steven Pinker. He says, cognitive psychology has shown that the mind best understands facts when they are woven into a conceptual fabric, such as a narrative. Disconnected facts in the mind are like unlinked pages on the web. They might as well not exist. So your job as designers, your job as leaders in business, your job as students about to enter the business world is to take facts and functions and detail and weave it into a story. Because if you do that, if you can connect that and if can, customers can understand that, you will be successful. Who do you think this guy is? Anyone? Plato? Anyone? Aristotle. Ah, oh, there we are. Don't worry, he's got a great beard, I think. Don't you think? Some people said, I did this talk once and someone said, is it you? I was like, uh, kind of, yeah. Aristotle, right? This is what Aristotle said about stories. And this is, he's basically the, the, the father of Western thought. So we should listen to Aristotle sometimes. He says this, a whole, so something that's complete, and he's talking here, particularly here about stories and poems, or poetics, he called it. A whole is what has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And anyone who's done basic level kind of uh, English uh, or, or language and stories will understand that structure, right? In the West, we like a beginning, a middle, and an end. And um, this is what he says, well-constructed plots must not therefore begin and end at random. I mean, imagine that, chaos. But, but must embody the formula we have stated. So when was the last time you read a story and the end just kind of wasn't there? You're just like, eh, that's rubbish. So, you know, you need to have the structure to, for people to feel whole, for people to feel complete. Now, that's the theory. A bit more, but more simple now. So why does he say the beginning, the middle, and the end? Well, put it, put it very simply, it's really interesting. Because the neuropsychologists tell us that we actually, it's a physical thing when we're engaging with stories. Our brains fire off different chemicals, which kind of actually physically change us. And they can measure this. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So, at the beginning of a story, usually, like, the, the hero's kind of having a good time in the status quo, and then some danger appears, like, and so all of our brains, we're listening to the story, and all our brains, like, we, we release cortisol, right, and we're all like, which is the, the chemical, the, the hormone that makes us kind of sit up and take note, like, whoa, danger is coming, okay, and then in the middle of the story, what happens, this is my simplified version, but you'll, be with, you'll, you'll bear with me, is that we start learning. We learn with the hero, what is this danger? How can we overcome it? How do we get stronger? How do we resolve this danger? So as change begins to happen in the story, we fire off uh, dopamine, which is kind of like give the drug, that kind of the hormone that makes us feel better about stuff. And I'm sure some of our other speakers might hint on this later. It's when we achieve something, we get a little hit of dopamine. And then finally, 
At the end of the story, the danger goes, the dragon's slayed, the asteroid's blown up, and we all feel happy. And so we release oxytocin, which is the, they call it the hug hormone, which is basically where you feel all mushy and happy and nice. So stories actually change the way that we think. Now, this is important because in your customer journey, okay, at the start, you know, where is, what's the danger? What's the problem that our customer has, that our, our user has? As we are helping them get through it, what are we helping them achieve and learn and, and discover? And then what is the end utopia? What does that look like? This guy, um, Paul J. Zak, amazing, did an amazing experiment. And what he did was he had uh, two groups uh, of people, and he put them into like a, a, a theater, probably not too dissimilar to this. And he played them a narrative, a story, a very sad story about um, a little boy who was terminally ill. Now, what's really interesting is that he took blood samples before they came in, and then blood samples before they, when they went out. And at the, end of the, at the end, after they'd seen this very, very sad story, he asked them whether the money that they were going to be paid to take part in that experiment, if you like, could be paid to a charity which related to the boy's terminal or illness. And, he, and some of them chose to do that. Now, what's fascinating is that they could predict with 80% accuracy whether somebody would take the money that they were going to be paid for that event and pay it to the charity or not, just based on the chemicals in their blood. In other words, how their brains responded to the story. So what I'm trying to say here is stories are incredibly powerful, and archetypes, as we'll get onto, fit into storytelling. And just think about this from a, just a, sometimes I talk to very hard-nosed business, hard, hard business people, right? And they're like, show me the money. So OK, well, just think about this, right? On your right here is a June handbag. In the UK, you'd buy this from somewhere like Marks & Spencer, which is like a, 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 a sort of a department store, right? Um, nothing special, just a general department store. Uh, no, apologies to Marks & Spencer. You are special, but in regard to this, right? So here's a June handbag, 55 UK pounds, roughly. Great. Here's another handbag, 1,690 pounds. Quality of both will be very similar. Pro the product will do the same thing. For the, for the buyer. So why is it that this one is valued almost at 3,000% more in terms of monetary value? And the answer is because of the Gucci logo here. And if you were to say, well, how is that worth more than the little circular thing there? And the answer is story. Because every billboard you've passed or consumers have passed since they were small, every magazine they've opened, Every advert that they've watched on TV has told them a story that if you are a glamorous, luxurious person, right, this is for you. The price point says it. Everything about it says it. And if that fits with your story, as it fits with my wife's story, then she will want to, uh, you know, you'll want to purchase it. Right. Now, two, two important other theoretical tools before we get practical. How am I doing? Good. I want to share with you two things. If you, you, some of you may be aware of these things, but if you are... Sorry, but if you're not, hey, hopefully it'll be good for you. The first, before we get into archetypes, is the hero's journey. And then the second is archetypes. So what's the hero's journey? The hero's journey was first articulated by this chap, Joseph Campbell. He wrote this book called um, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's quite a famous book if you've done any story theory. And one of the cool things about it is that he did a load, a ton of research on stories across the world. And what he found was, was that there was this typical story arch that appeared in all stories. He called it the monomyth. So let me walk you through it very briefly, and you'll see what I mean, right? So the hero starts off here in the status quo, life's normal. But then there's this call to adventure. Something happens. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or whatever, right? And everyone's like, ooh, what is this? So, and the hero at first resists. They don't want to go for an adventure. They're having fun in the status quo. Everything's good. So they're kind of like, nah, I'm all right, thanks. But then something else will happen in the story where a mentor will appear, Obi-Wan Kenobi appears or whatever, and tells the hero various things, gives them a tool, gives them some knowledge. The hero is like, I don't even need this. I don't really want this. But hey, thank you anyway. And then what happens is the hero has to depart from their normal world. Something will happen where they'll have to leave their location. They'll have to go into the Hunger Games. They'll have to do something. They come out of their comfort zone. 
And now they're in a special world where there's various trials. There's people that are for them, people that are against them. They have this massive crisis down here at 6 o'clock, which is usually like um, some big issue, like an asteroid will hit the planet, um, Sauron will destroy Middle Earth, whatever it is. It's a huge crisis that the, the hero, using the things that the mentor has given them right back at the beginning, uses to overcome that crisis. And then the story rapidly continues. There's usually some treasure. There's a beautiful result. And then the hero has to return back again to their ordinary world. But something's changed. The hero has taken out their various flaws. They've, they've kind of been better as a person because of what's gone on. And we, as listeners and watchers of the story, have also grown and learned things with the, with, with the hero. Now, this pattern whether we are um, in Indonesia listening to a, a tribal chief or if we're in Hollywood uh, watching a, a film, latest blockbuster, this pattern comes up again and again. And actually what happens is, is the psychologists say that we're running this little storyline in our mind in various areas of our lives all the time. So it's really important that we understand there's, a, there's these three parts, remember, there's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that's how we see the world, before the change, making the change, and then the impact after the change. So, why am I telling you all this? Well, because, well, just, just a little, little aside. By the way, any fans of Star Wars in the room? Little fans. So, George Lucas, who created Star Wars, if you didn't know, he um, got up a, a speech in the National Arts Club in 1985, a long time ago, and he actually credited the success of Star Wars and the narrative to the work of Joseph Campbell, right? And if you think of all the major films, Lord of the Rings, The Hunger Games, Harry Potter, all of these big films, they all follow the same storyline. Anyway, I won't bore you with that, but there we are. So that's the, 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 the mono myth. Now, if I was to say, well, where, how is this useful? How can we use this in our work? And I have a suggestion for you. The biggest mistake I think we make sometimes is that we think we are the hero in the story. Right? We think, hey, this is all about us. Let's talk about how wonderful we are. That's a mistake. Because actually, I think brands appear up here. The customer is the hero in the story. They've got a challenge. They're about to start a new venture, buy a new product, overcome some challenge. And we as a brand show up as a mentor to them. We're going to show up and give them the tools they need, the help they need, the support, the encouragement, the things that they need to go through this difficult time they've got ahead. Now, obviously, you know, this is dramatizing some of the stuff, but it is important for us to appreciate. And that, finally, you're like flipping it, Matt. It's only taking you half an hour. But that finally gets us on to the subject of archetypes. Now, Rui, how long have I got till I finish? 20, great, good, good, good. So, a little bit more theory. Archetypes, who's heard of Carl Jung? Anyone? Carl Jung, a very influential thinker, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst around the break of the 19th century, okay? He was around the same time as Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was like, hey, we have this thing called the, the, um, uh, the what is it? He has the, uh, the, uh, the conscious and the unconscious minds, right? And the basic theory is, I told you I'm not a psychologist, so this is my basic, right? Everyone's like, what's he gonna say now? But the basic theory is, is that you react to things in your conscious mind because of stuff that's happened to you in the past which has sunk back into your unconscious mind. Okay, so you, ex so, so you can respond a certain way and you think, why did I respond like that? And when you actually think it back through, it's probably because something happened to you before in your life. So that's all great. But, but Carl Jung, he was working um, in, in, uh, with patients and he was finding these patients were, were saying similar things, right? Completely unconnected. And he realized like, hey, maybe there's something else other than just something that people have actually experienced. Maybe there's something underneath it all, something bigger that connects us all as human beings. He called it the collective unconscious. And he called these patterns that he identified archetypes. They are patterns of human behavior. This is what he said, forms or images of a collective nature which occur practically all over the earth as constituents of myths and at the same time, individual products of the unconscious. So he's kind of working on this. And, and what he realized was that some of the things that he was hearing from his patients, he could recognize patterns in that from ancient, the ancient classic myths and stories that he, he was brought up on. So he was a classical scholar. It's like, hey, this is weird because some of the people he was speaking to were uneducated. They didn't know about these myths. And yet 
This was in their, their madnesses, their illnesses, the, their, their problems that they were facing. So Jung has this theory. He calls it the collective unconscious. It falls out with Sigmund Freud, right? Because Freud's only up here saying, look, we've got the unconscious and the unconscious. So, uh, Jung says, no, there's something underneath, something that's commonly shared, like human nature that connects all of us. And yes, this and this is here, the unconscious and the conscious. But there's something deep-rooted in our psyche that connects all of us. And stories are part of that deepness. Like, you don't go to a part of the world and no one likes stories. Like, it's something that we all know, instinctively. Now, that work came, uh, and I have to give credit where credit's due, right? Because it's not, I'm not an intellectual um, in that sense or an academic in that sense. So, this book was massively influential. It was around 2000. It was published by Margaret Mark and Carol S. Pearson. They wrote The Hero and the Outlaw. And what they did is they took some of Jung's theory and they applied it to brand. And what they discovered through a lot of research is that top brands in each category actually embody a particular archetype, a particular type of character that is also amplified in stories that we all instinctively connect to. I was like, wow, that's phenomenal, right? So if you want to learn the theory, it's a big book, but go for it, grab this book. It's, some of the examples are now a little bit out of date, but the theory still holds. So remember, the customer, if the customer's the hero, and we're a character in their story, and we're trying to manage the meaning that they're going to attach to us, then I would say to anybody involved in brand building, well, what kind of character are we going to be? How are we going to show up for the customer? So this is why we should use archetypes, and I'll come on to them in a minute and explain who they are. But they tell and help create better stories, which is powerful for brands. They help communicate swiftly because I can understand instinctively what this brand's going to do for me. They humanize us. We're not talking, you know, functions and features all the time. We're, we're seeing it in the context of our humanity. They connect deeply with us. They bring alignment, which is the big thing, and they elevate meaning. Basically, they help us manage meaning. So you see where I've gone now. So we've gone full circle. We're back to meaning again, right? Everybody still with me? Yes. Nods. Good. Okay. You want to you want to see some of the archetypes? Yeah. Yeah. Right, here's the 12 archetypes. I'm gonna walk them through really carefully. Now, I'm gonna give you a little bit of detail, but there's, there's 12 positive, there's other archetypes as well, like a zombie, for example, you would say that's an archetype. Now, no brand really wants to be a zombie, right? So we just put that to one side. So these are the 12 that Margaret Mark and Carol S. Pearson have identified based on the work of Carl Jung. Now, let me walk you through. And I want you to think, and by the way, these are tied to consumer customer motivations. I may get time to talk about that in a minute. But just have a think about your business, your company, your product, your service. Think about how you want to show up for your customer. And let me walk through these and see if you think, well, I think I'm this kind of archetype, right? Just see. So the first up is the caregiver. Caregivers are about looking after people, a bit like Mary Poppins, a kind of a motherly kind of look there, nurturing, thoughtful. A brand example would be Johnson's baby. And they're in a, in a, in a story, they're kind of like your nurse, doctor kind of character. The next one's the citizen. The citizen just sits in. They're the voice of reality, the voice of the common person. And so Ron Weasley and Harry Potter, right? Ron doesn't want to be the hero. Ron's just there to bring the voice of reason to Harry, who is the hero. And he's like the everyday man, everyday, everyday person. And so a brand example of this would be Ikea, the wonderful everyday. Like, let's just celebrate normality. That's, that's their kind of um, mantra. And so they don't want to stand out. They want to just be the voice of reason, the community. What about the creator? I'm sure we've got a few of these archetypes running around this room. But the creator is kind of like the person in the workshop um, creating something of value. And so we go to creators to help us do what's next, to innovate. And so if you think about Geppetto in Pinocchio, creating stuff. Lego is a great... I've got two small boys. Nearly forgot how many I had then. <laughs> got two small boys, play a lot of Lego. And what are we doing all the time? We're creating things, we're imagining things. And so br the br a brand that sits in that space, in both experience and positioning, is Lego. Here's another one, the explorer. Okay, explorer archetypes. We go to them to break free from the constraints that we have. They're going to take us to a new destination. They're going to guide us there. They're going, to, they're going to help us kind of experience something new by travel and going to a new destination. They, they hate confinement. And so you think of, you know, Lara Croft in Tomb Raider or the North Face. 
um, as a brand. You never see an advert of the North Face with someone sat in an office going, the North Face? No, no, no. You're out swinging from a mountain or something because they're going to help us never stop exploring. They're an archetype that will help us get out there. There is also a hero archetype. So sometimes, yes, the customer's the hero, but sometimes we show up as a hero with them to help them fight the battle that they're about to fight. The hero is all about saving the world from some terrible evil. So it's a popular archetype to, to leverage. So what's the evil that your product, brand, service is trying to fight against? So you can think of all of the DC, um, Marvel characters is such a popular kind of uh, narrative that we just consume and consume and consume again. Um, brand example, Nike, or Nike, depending on where you've come from. I'm a Nike guy, but there we are. Um, they, they, their basic message of just do it, which is so popular globally, right? is to basically say, we're gonna fight the evil of unfitness, right? We're gonna, we're gonna all be athletes, we're gonna be better um, people and, and just do it. What about the innocent? I love the innocent. The innocent is all, basically you go to, there's people in life, isn't there, that they're just super positive, right? And you go to them, sometimes they're a little bit naive, but we love them because we need faith and optimism in this world. And so the innocent, you can think of Belle in Beauty and the Beast or Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, is all about being happy and they live their lives in such a positive way. Um, if you think of a brand example, I don't know if you have this here in Portugal, but it's a smoothie brand called Innocent Smoothies. And in the UK, they massively position themselves on everything is nice and innocent, all the good stuff that goes into our smoothies. And um, they have campaigns like people knit little hats for them in the cold winter that Rui was talking about earlier. Um, and they have competitions like that. It's all very innocent. It's lovely. So that's another brand that we can consider there. What about the Jester? Jester is all about fun and entertainment. Um, to live in the moment. So you think of you know, Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, or you think of brands like Ben and Jerry's, who don't take their ingredient list very seriously, as you can tell there. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an entertainment positioning. You go to these brands for fun and, um, and energy. What about the lover archetype? Love is all about relationships and deep connection. So if you've got a product, like maybe a luxury product, where you really want people to really appreciate it, then you know, the, the, the lover archetype could be something to consider. So you've got like classics like Jack Dawson, Romeo and Juliet you know, is another one. And a brand example, another brand example, um, ice cream brand, Hagen Dars, um, they're all about that more sensual kind of aspect and they position their ice cream in that way. What about the magician? The magician is about transformation and change, making dreams come true. Unanticipated consequences is what they hate. They're going to just transform something into something amazing. And I love, uh, like, Tabasco sauce, right? So you've got a boring plate of soup, but you put Tabasco sauce in it, and boom, it's an atom bomb, right? So that's great. The, the, the best advert I ever saw for Tabasco sauce, I don't know if you've seen this one, is this, like, old cowboy on his uh, ranch, and he's rocking up and down. And the, the, the sun's setting, and he's eating some pizza, right? And he puts Tabasco sauce in his pizza, and he's eating his pizza. And then this fly comes, mosquito, and lands on his arm, and then bites him, and he goes, oh, flicks it off. And in the darkness, you just hear this fly, it goes, and blows up. So good, because it's transforming, it's transformational. So, you know, this is a great archetype uh, to, to, to sort of communicate swiftly transformation. Couple more, what about the rebel, right? Rui's a rebel because he's, he's breaking the norm and he's doing something new. Rebels are, perhaps Rui's not quite on this level, but you know, maybe he is deep down, about revenge or revolution, okay? They wanna destroy what's not working and build something that will work in opposition, in sometimes quite aggressive ways. Their tactic is really to disrupt and destroy and shock. So if you think of Han Solo in Star Wars, everyone's going in one direction, Han Solo's going in the other direction. And so brands like Brewdog in the UK, they're very much positioning themselves anti what's already there. Sage, two more, sage. Sages are like the gatekeepers of wisdom and knowledge and data and truth. We go to the sages for that knowledge because we don't have it. So if you think of Yoda, you go to Yoda, right, because you want to know about the force. And Yoda knows everything about the force. He is a sage archetype. And um, brand examples, like you could think Google, you could think Wikipedia, but I like The Economist. I don't know if you can read that. It says, I never read The Economist, management trainee, aged 42. So what it's saying is, is like, you say, well, why are they still a management trainee at that age? Well, because they've never read The Economist. Come to The Economist for knowledge, for wisdom, for information to get ahead in your career. Super smart, sage brands. Final one is the ruler archetype. 
calm, in control, order out of chaos. We go to the rulers to lead us because we need that structure in our lives. Um, and so you can think of Aragorn in Lord of the Rings as a classic leader archetype. Brands like Rolex, Hugo Boss, they position themselves in this kind of authoritative positioning. And we go to them because if, 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 if we want a little bit of that in our lives and we see ourselves like that, we will buy from them. So there's the 12 archetypes. That was very probably a bit too much detail, but you know what I mean. And I appreciate we've not got huge amounts of time. So I just want to kind of um, mention this. Um, these are all tied to customer motivations, uh, and the uh, Carol S. Pearson and Margaret Mark also kind of align some of these archetypes to motivations that customers have. I'm not going to spend loads of time on that. Um, I do have a PDF that if you connect with me on LinkedIn and mention Design FAO, I'll happily send you a lot more information on this. I was also going to play a few. How long did you say we've got? Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to play you one advert. I had loads because I've talked too much, right? I'm going to play one. We're going to, I was going to play the what's the archetype game, right? Which we all want to play, which, which you will now be playing every time you drive down the street and every advert you watch. You'll be like, huh, I can categorize this, this brand into an archetype. But I'm going to play you one. Hopefully it will work if it doesn't, right? This is a, no, not a famous brand. I just want to see if you can identify which archetype this is. Oh, there's no sound. So that's no good. Sound? With a flash speed bump. It's really tacky, by the way. Speed bump. Cleans up the impossible. Attach the wet cloth to the flash speed bump. Speed bump sticky bits, banky bits, and ruddy awkward bits. Then fling the Evo Bing in the bin. It's quick, easy, and hygienic. Stand up to daily dirt with new flash speed bump. The hero archetype, right? Is fighting against. Dirt. I was going to play you one like this, which is all a lover, a lover archetype. Let's not go there. I was going to play you this one from Land Rover, which is all about like you know exploration, explorer archetype. Ruby drives a Land Rover. Just putting that out there. Um, I was going to play you this one, which is all about creation. From Bowmore. Um, wow. That was loud. A masterpiece, sculpted by time. So you see how that's a creator archetype, sculpted by time, really kind of showing you the depth of how they create stuff. So th this is a powerful set of tools. I won't do that. I was going to also show you Apple's famous 1984 advert, which is rebellious to the extreme. But I've got to whiz on very quickly, because there's a couple more things I want to talk about before I sit down. Um, have a think about this when you're thinking about creating product and, and customer experiences. Well, who's the villain in the story? What's the evil the consumer or the customer's trying to overcome? What's the yin to your yang as a brand? Who are your customer's archetype? So there's you as a brand, but what kind of role are they playing in the story? And what archetype are your partners around you that connect with you to help fulfill those, those things? Strategically, these are big questions. I use um, archetypes as well to look at competitor maps. This is some work that I did a while ago for a, for a, medical, um, a high end medical clinic in London. And uh, we had uh, a whole suite of um, competitors that, as you can see, most of them, I would say, were showing up as a caregiver. And so what this allowed us to do strategically was to say, well, hey, look, no one's occupying some of these spaces. What if we showed up as the ruler? And so we actually created a whole new customer experience around um, a high-end um, luxury uh, clinical experience, which was very interesting in their market. So final thing, how can we use these in our work? Um, this is how I do it. So I work with teams and across companies to align around an archetype or two, right? But there's always a primary archetype. If you get that alignment, how powerful it is, because you get the business people and the creative people and the product people, and everyone knows, hey, we're showing up like the sage for our customer. And it's at a broad level, that's really helpful, because at least you've got a direction. And now you've got to orientate everything towards it. So what I tend to do is build out traits. So okay, if we're going to show up as the sage in the customer experience, how does that feel? What does that trait look like? And then we can develop from the traits a look and feel and a tone, a tone of voice, TOV, and we can start developing brand experiences. All aligned and it kind of, kind of fits together beautifully. So your trait is a distinguishing quality, like an attribute. And so this is an example of some work I did recently where we have, okay, I think these were, the, these were a ruler sage brand. And so I worked with um, uh, a chap called Paddy Gilmore, who's a really great uh, copywriter. And we worked on these principles. If we show up as the sage ruler, how does that feel? And we work with their team on this. It's going to feel authoritative, intelligent, and luxurious. And so in all our touch points, 
are we authoritative, intelligent, and luxurious? And if we're not, then maybe we should be. So it opens up those questions. We're not on brand. And so you can build those, the detail and the level and connect it all to a theoretical strategy that, that leadership have agreed to and commercial people have agreed to. And so you can also build from these down into um, tone of voice principles. And on this particular one, we had provocative and nobody's fool were our two principles. So every time a headline message is written, is it provocative? And does it say, we are nobody's fool? We're not going to take fools lightly. And they were the two, the two aspects. So you can kind of hopefully see the principles from archetypes can start to come to bear. This is um, a beautiful example. This is Nando's. Do you have Nando's here in Faro? No. No Nando's in Faro. South. You don't like Nando's? So this is a really culturally inappropriate. Yes. I will move on. <laughs> This is your hometown, because they're South African, and they claim to have Portuguese roots, but they're not. So, I knew that. <laughs> that was deliberate to provoke response. Um, but the, the th interesting thing about the success of their lie is that they have built their whole brand around the archetype of the explorer and traveling through um, the South African parts of the world, right? And so it's very, very interesting, although but they borrowed a little bit from Portugal. Let's, let's put that out there. So, the other thing I was going to say was, and then I'm, I am going to wrap up, is that when you're thinking about everybody here creates experiences for customers or is involved in creating experience for customers. So when you think about a classic customer journey, if you have an archetype at the heart of it, you can begin to really build out those experiences, say in the awareness, consideration, decision before they're a customer, or in their onboarding and in their servicing. And when they leave, they're offboarding. You can bring the archetype to bear on those things and build your touch points accordingly. As I mentioned, I've got an archetypes download. So if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, just mention design FAO, I will ping you that absolutely free of charge and you can read through it at your leisure. But any talk, I think, is not complete unless we quote from Steve Jobs. <laughs> so Steve Jobs apparently said this once, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And we can be that person. We can be the designer, the creative, the product person in the room that can begin to tell the story, not from the company's perspective, but from the customer's perspective, because they are the heroes. So my final message to you all is manage your meaning. Thank you.